Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and welcome to my daily webinars. Uh, I don't even know. I should start numbering them, I think, actually, at this point, because I've been doing them every week for like five weeks now, so I have quite a few. You can find all the previous webinars on my YouTube channel, Surefoot Equine, and if you subscribe, you'll get a notification when we put up a new one. Um, today, my guest is Daisy Bicking from Integrative Horse Hoof Care. Sorry, Integrative Hoof Care. And she was with me in the first week, I think, right? Way back. And you had to do your webinar from your vehicle. Mm hmm Right? Yeah. Um, and so it's really nice that Daisy's yeah, home is coming up with a horse. And, yeah. yeah. She's got lots of props and suddenly the internet's unstable. Hopefully it'll come back. It was really good when we were testing it out. Um, so this is uh, sort of the continuation from Daisy's first webinar. You can find that on my YouTube channel. So do go back and watch it. There was tons of great information. We'll have Daisy do a brief review, but we wanna move on and get onto some new things. So Daisy, welcome. It's so nice to have you here. Well, thanks Wendy. It's great to be here. I'm excited to share. So just give us a little background again for those of people who might not know you. Yeah, so I have been a professional health care provider for 16 years. Um, I focus my work on rehabilitation and um, using barefoot approaches, boots, and glue-on composite shoes. Um, I have a rehabilitation center here in Pennsylvania near Philadelphia where we have horses here for foot rehab. And then I also travel to see clients off the farm. I also have a school where I teach hoof care to anyone who wants to learn. And um, of course, all, right now it's all virtual, but um, normally I travel around and teach classes, hands-on courses, um, informational courses, and as well as hosting courses here at the farm. But right now it's all online given the current pandemic situation. But you've got quite a, a lot of information on that online course, right? Are you still there? Yeah, I am. I can hear you. Are you with me, Daisy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I oh. can hear you. Your video is a little you. slow. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. It's just that your video isn't quite with your words. Um, I, I'm hoping <laughs> it'll catch up. <laughs> it was fine when we tested it, and it just yeah. said that. That would be annoying. I'm sorry. It was a little bit slow. It's okay. You know, the, this is part of the virtual life that we're living now. Is It's not always exactly how we'd like it. That's true. Yeah. Okay, That's so tell true. us a little bit where the, the online is courses any for anyone, and they can find those online courses by going where? Yeah, so the, the two, I have one online course, which is a beginning trimming course. That is on Patreon under Daisy Haven Farm. And the other course is actually case studies and how-to videos from my daily work. And that is also on Patreon, but under my personal name, Daisy Bicking. Great, so they can go to Patreon and find both of your courses. And um, at yeah. some point, maybe just type the link in the chat so that um, they have that, because sure. I don't know how to spell Patreon. <laughs> yeah, well, they have to make it complicated, don't they? Yeah. Um, by the way, while Daisy's typing that, um, this is the yellow brick road that Allie Thurston found for me and sent to me because um, I did have the poppy field the other day. But, you know, we're always on this adventure and we're following the yellow brick road. And like I always said, that Dorothy had the ruby slippers the whole time. She just had to learn how to use them. And so much of this information that we're presenting in the webinar is, you know, it's all sitting there right in front of you. It's just learning how to read it. And so the more we get good at reading what's in front of us and seeing the detail, then the better we are for our horses. And the more we can catch things early and not wait till it gets really out of hand. Yes, absolutely. All right, so what have you got for us today, Daisy? Well, so you and I had been talking about how spring is the most risky season for some of our horses with the risk of laminitis. So I wanted to pull up um, one of my presentations I give to students who want to learn more about laminitis and we can just go through it at whatever pace you think and Wendy, you can interject questions and Great. Just, you know, go, go through that as you like. And then I have, awesome. I have props. I have, I have bones. 
I brought bones and I have models. So we yeah. love props. props. <laughs> yeah. So we'll be able to talk about all sorts of stuff. So let me um, load. Way, today I have my Hoof Care Summit shirt on because Daisy and I were both at Hoof Summit and I had my booth next to her. So it was really fun to get to, to um, be neighbors. Nice. Yes. That's always fun, isn't it? Yeah. So we'll play this. Okay. All right. Can you see that okay? Yep. Just fine. And I'm just going to hopefully our little window okay. will stay up out of the way. Okay. All right. So stop me if you want me to expand on something or if you think there's something that's I'm getting too technical because I tend to do that. Okay. Um, so, you know, laminitis is certainly very, very devastating to the horse. Um, this was a horse that had uh, laminitis due to retained placenta and she actually rotated and had her feet fall apart in all four feet and it's so traumatic to watch um, and she did not come back from this unfortunately. Um, so you know one of the biggest challenges of laminitis is how ma many different ways it can manifest in the horse. So this slide is showing six different feet that all have laminitis, laminitis being the inflammation of the hoof. And sometimes we use the word founder. And founder is more of a layman's term, um, which actually comes from the nautical term founder with a submarine, meaning to sink or, or dive down. And that's what the bone is doing inside the hoof. The attachment of the bone to the wall becomes inflamed and um, there's a lot of different theories on exactly how that happens. We don't even have an exact um, uh, pathway that laminitis happens for every horse, although we're getting closer to figuring those things out. Um, so, you know, for any of these horses, it can be different reasons. It can look different. They can have a different amount of damage to their foot. And the amount of damage can take six to eight weeks after the initial onset to actually show up, which is crazy. Yeah. So your so, horse, you know, is a little obese and gets out on pasture. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Dr. Harmon talks about the equivalency of- Can you hear um, me, Wendy? I'm there, I can hear you. Um, is that laminitis is like the equivalent of a heart attack in a human. Can you hear me? Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Is there a delay on our connection? There is, but I'm glad it's a slideshow and not a lot of video right now. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yes, that's true. Yeah, so it is like if you have a heart attack, heaven forbid, different people are going to have different amounts of damage to their heart and it's going to be more severe for some and less severe than others. That makes sense. Yep. So, you know, the most important part of, of helping any laminated course is that you have to have a team of of professionals that's helping you. You need your veterinarian, absolutely. The owner has to be involved and hands-on. And of course you need your hoof care provider to be part of that team as well. Otherwise you won't be successful. And if your professionals don't agree on what should happen to help your horse, absolutely I would recommend that you get a team that agrees. That is probably the most important thing because you're going to get caught in the middle as the owner and that's a terrible place to be. And the owner it really has to be the advocate for the horse with the entire team. Yes. Yes, exactly. And sometimes the owner doesn't have enough information. So if your veterinarian and your farrier and say your barn manager or your trainer or your best friend all have different opinions about what should be happening, you're stuck in the middle and it's very difficult. It's yeah. very hard. So the, the best thing you can do is, of course, be educated yourself as much as you can and then select people to listen to who are on the same page and follow one course of action for a period of time before you decide to deviate one way or the other. Otherwise, it's really difficult. So it's really important that you can actually talk and discuss with the team, not just have one person dictating and uh, so that everybody is on the same page. Exactly, it's critical. It's probably the most important thing to success with helping laminated courses. Yeah. So, you know, 
different horses can come back from laminitis, but to different degrees. Um, if they're chronically laminitic, meaning this has happened repeatedly for them over time, then each laminitic event gets harder to bring them back to some level of soundness or performance work. Um, a lot of these horses can be geriatric and they can have other, other problems like arthritis or um, other uh, inflammatory related issues that create other complications for them. But to me, I feel like a foot is rehabilitated when it's uh, back to, able to go back to the horse's previous job before it had laminitis. So I set the bar pretty high. If that horse was a dressage horse, I want it to go back to being a dressage horse. If the horse was a pasture ornament, it can be a pasture ornament or better. So, you know, obviously in my presentations, I have a lot of pictures of things. Um, some of these um, make more sense than others. This is just a, um, a photograph with the radiograph superimposed. So you can see how the external hoof appears and how the internal bone alignment is actually going on inside that foot. Those are really cool photos. I love them. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, they're really fun. Yeah, they're really fun. Um, this was a horse that was very painful that was actually sold at auction and came into a rescue situation that I was able to help them with. And so you can really see how that bone moves out of position. And this is a, an example can you of your actually- screen while we look at that, Daisy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, let me unshare my screen so I can show you this. Where's my mouse? Sorry, there it is. It's okay. Unshare. Uh, why is it doing that? Should be right at the top. Stop share, there it is. Sorry, not new share. Okay. Stop share. Great, I'm gonna make you big so that we can okay. really see this. All right, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So this is actually a Brumby foot from Australia from Brian Hampson, who's done all the research on, um, on the feral horses there, the feral Brumby horses. And, you know, we say that laminitis doesn't occur in the wild horse, but it absolutely does. So in this, this foot, you can see this is what the foot looks like from the outside. So it's got, you know, some cracks and, you know, some can defects to it. Can you pull it back it. just a tiny bit? Just, there you That's go. It. Yeah, it gets okay. a little distorted when you get too close. Got it. Thank you for the feedback. Because I'm just looking at a thumbnail and I really can't tell. Yep. So you've got some defects here in the wall. And, you know, the coronary band should be more even than this. This is from the rotation that the back of the bones and the soft tissue go up this way. And there's a dish to this horse's foot. So that's a sign of, of uh, rotation or laminitis sometimes to be cautious of. And so when you look then on the internal anatomy, you can see that there is, this is the outer wall and the inner wall, the white and the black. And then all of this area over here, this is all the corium or the blood and nerves that has been damaged by the inflammation and the um, separation of the lamini, which is what holds the bone to the wall. And then here's the bone down here. And that should be more parallel to this dorsal wall here. The front is of it actually wall. breaking through the sole or just close? It's close, not actually breaking through. It, it, does, it doesn't really have concavity anymore. And you can see there's a little bulge here. Can you appreciate that? Yeah. Yeah, so that's the bone pressing down on that sole. Now, well, was this horse, did anybody see this horse before you wound up with that foot? Yeah. This was, was a feral horse running around. In, in actually, this is in New Zealand. So it was running around. Yeah, so apparently the way that I was told is that um, this area of, of New Zealand, they get, um, every 10 years they have a horrible monsoon season and all the dry grasses there green up and the horses all gorge on this green grass they're not used to and so they become metabolic and they founder. And the ones that survive have ugly feet like this, but they do survive. And then some of them clearly don't, and those become lunch for somebody, you know. There actually aren't any predators in New Zealand, so. <laughs> so they just decompose, go back to the earth. So yep. this, on the other hand, would be a more normal hoof appearance of a horse that does not have laminitis, where you can still see that inner and outer wall. And then the, the blood supply, that corium, is really compact in there. It should be no more than about a quarter inch or four to five millimeters. And it goes around the bone this way and it's everything is fit tightly and parallel together with appropriate sole depth 
And this would be the white line, which actually is yellow. I don't know why we call it the white line. Yeah, I've yellow. always wondered that. <laughs> yeah, I think it actually, my theory is that if you look in the old textbooks, that the inner wall is white and they could have been looking at the inner wall, calling that the white line because it's drawn all the way to the coronary band where the white line is a blending of material of the inner wall and the soul. And its job is to prevent the infiltration of bacteria and debris into the foot. And it grows from the terminal papillae or these little hair-like protrusions on the bottom of P3. Can you put so, the two feet up side by side? Yeah, you read my mind. Well, somebody, yes, and somebody asked. Wow, that's really amazing. Mm. Yeah, and to the, see the amount of damage that can happen. Well, and, and the, the damaged one, the, the foundered one, is the coffin bone even distorted in its shape? Like you have a nice point yeah. and the other one looks rounded. Yeah, yeah. And that's because on this one, this is where like when we talk about um, laminated courses getting a ski tip or, or a, a lip to the front of the bone. Let me just find the right spot here. So right up here, that is the circumflex artery. Okay. And that artery nourishes the bottom of the bone. So if this is your average sort of laminated coffin bone here, see here's the lipping. Yeah, and Dr. Belker calls that? that slipper toe. Slipper toe, right. Yeah, I most, most generically call it a ski tip, but that's what he's calling it, right? Correct. And so the reason that happens is that artery runs all along here. And when the force, so I'm, my hand is the blood supply around the bone here. And when that rotation happens, that artery slips this way. Let me show you this one. There's another model, hold on. Oh, wow. It's really? it looks like show and tell. <laughs> I know, this is fun. You can really see it right here. Yeah. So, so see, this is the artery right there, that dot right there, can you see that? Yep. Okay, and this is the corium right here. Yep, All this. So like a, it looks like a space, a sort of a tannish brown space. Yep. And it's, it's, it's slipped above the tip of the bone and see this dark, all this dark line down here at the bone, at the bottom. Yep. You see it's like dark right there. That's hemorrhaging from, from the blood supply getting compressed and crushed because the bone was moving down in the hoof capsule and rotating. And then the, is that white line really distorted in this foot? Yeah. So that's where you get a laminar wedge. So, so the white line on this is, is this wide, this whole thing. So the, the outer wall and the inner wall are here. And then that laminar wedge on this foot goes all the way to the coronary band, which is the worst kind of laminitis, because that means that your laminar attachment all the way to the coronary band has, has suffered detachment. Wow. Yeah, it's wild. Um, let's see what a normal one might look yeah, like. Yeah, let's have a normal comparison again. <laughs> so there's a normal. Okay. So you can see outer wall, inner wall, and then the corium. Although this corium is a little stretched because this is a hind foot that has um, a low, low heel angle. Okay. And that causes the corium to flex out a little bit. But see that dot? That's the circumflex artery right there. And oh, see wow. how it's below the bone? Yeah. Where this one, so I can get them both on the screen here. So this one versus that one. Oh yeah, it's literally moved up, or yep. more likely the bones moved down as Correct. opposed to, yes. Yeah. It's gravity. The problem here is load and gravity, right? So we think about why some horses rotate, some horses sink, some horses rotate more. I think a lot of that has to do with their postural compensations. Okay. Right, and the health of their foot at the time they have laminitis. Um, this is an, another interesting example. Can you see this one? Yep. So this one is a very acute laminate, laminitic foot where it is penetrating the sole down here. Yep. And all of this attachment of blood supply has completely let go. That's why there's air gaps there. And that over there, believe it or not, that is the circumflex artery right above wow. my finger. It's way far away from where it should be. Yeah, and the bone is all the way down here because it's, it's actually let go that fast. Wow. So somebody's saying, is the bone able to migrate due to the degeneration of the, of the hoof tissue? Is it chicken and egg? Well, okay. So that's, a, that's an excellent question. I mean, the bone moves because the, the lamini, I'm trying to find a good example here. 
the lamini are, are like pleats on a lampshade that are Velcroed together. And when you get laminitis, that attachment starts to loosen and get inflamed and swollen. And then it starts to actually pull apart like this. And there's a really good video out there by Chris Pollitt of, of the lamini actually being pulled apart, like a slice of the lamina. And it looks like this. Like they've got two little tweezers on there and they're just pulling apart this section of lamina. It looks like wet tissue paper. Like it's just mm -hmm. horrible. And it just comes apart like this. So if you think about um, the role of the, here's another model. If you think about the role of the deep digital flexor tendon as it comes down on the back of the, of the bones here and attaches over the navicular bone to the bottom of the coffin bone, the job of that tendon is to pull the foot back in locomotion, mm -hmm. right? So it creates breakover. So there's this whole conversation about what makes the bone rotate. And so it's a combination of the whatever surface area of detachment if you have, if this is my, my hand is the hoof capsule and this is the bone, if you have the, the dorsal or the front surface of the bone, lamini is affected, attachment is affected, then you're going to rotate because the back of the foot has more attachment. If more surface area of detachment, including the back of the foot is affected, then you're going to have more of a sinking. However, what actually creates the most rotation even though it's not the deep digital flexor tendon pulling on the bone, it's the fact that that strong attachment opposes the tendon pulling to bring the hoof along. It's so amazing how that strong that lamina is when it's healthy then, because it's, uh, it's countering the strength of the muscle through the deep digital flexor. Exactly, exactly. So that lamina is what actually makes the foot follow the pull of the muscle and the tendon. Wow. Yeah, so imagine if the hoof capsule's here and the horse wants to break over and that muscle and tendon pulls to do this, then the whole foot follows. But if this attachment is not strong and the horse goes like this, there's going to be some leverage on that damaged lamini and it's going to cause some rotation. So when people say, Personal pet peeve is when we say that things are good or bad or right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's beneficial aspects to all these different ideas that we have about the foot and the horse and all of these things. So I hear from both sides, you know, horses that are in acute laminitis should be wedged up very high. They'll put them up 22 degrees, 18 degrees, wedging them high to limit the action of the deep digital flexor tendon pulling the bone out of position. And then you hear people that say that's totally wrong. You should lower the heels in laminitis to get pressure off, off of the circumflex artery and the sole in the front. And the answer is, is that it's all, it's all correct. There's a time and place for all of it. So yeah, if you hear someone say, your horse is in acute laminitis and you don't want your horse to move very much right now, pay attention to that. There is a time and place to keep horses quiet and not moving so much in laminitis. And then there's a time and place to, to get them moving again. The timing of that is critical. There's also a time and place to wedge these horses up. When they're super acute, we want to preserve as much attachment of lamini as we can. So if we just willy-nilly say, oh, I should be you know, walking my horse to increase circulation, or I'm going to trim the heels down and put the horse you know, in a flat boot to preserve the sole, that could actually be the exact thing that could exacerbate the problem that your horse is having, depending on the timing. So we're really back to the team and having the good, um, I'm just going to cancel this, um, the rec that we need the team and we need them to be able to get together and do the necessary diagnostics, x-rays, that sort of thing. So you know what's going on inside and you're not just simply guessing from an exterior view. I would think it's super important at that point to have pictures to yes. really see what's happening so then everybody can get together and confer and make a good decision. Exactly. So can I go back to my presentation? Because that's Absolutely. a good actually transition for what we're doing here. Yep. Okay. So let me do share screen. And we're going to share this screen. And then we're going to hit, just going to say share. And then we hit play. Okay. Can you see that okay? Um, it's, there it is. Yep. So this is why when I have a horse that's in acute laminitis, I put the horse in cloud boots or soft ride boots to start. 
because both of those boots are on a wedge. The pad inside has about an eight degree wedge to it. So it's a little bit of insurance um, with the whole tendon question. Should I be raising the tendon? Should I be lowering the heels? Which should I do? The boot's great, it gives cushion. They're easy to keep clean, put some uh, gold bond powder in them to keep the foot from sweating too much or getting uh, too punky in there. Um, this is one of the most uh, helpful interventions that as the owner you can do is get your horse in some of these boots that have a slight wedge um, until the vet and the farrier can get there. If you don't have these types of boots, certainly a deeply bedded stall will work in the short run. If you had sure foot pads, would that be a good thing to do? Absolutely. You could totally put the horse on sure foot pads. In fact, even standing these horses, giving them the option to stand on one of your slants yeah. um, could be awesome for these horses. You know, give them a choice. You know, do you want to put them on a soft pad and see where they go, right? Where's their comfort? If they're going to their toe in those pads, offer them the slants with the wedge to the back so that they can really just relieve the pull of that tendon on their sensitive lamina at the moment. I know the tendon doesn't pull. We say that the muscles pulling. Right. But right. So, so yeah. basically in your immediate moment, you want to get your horse into something squishy and soft to alleviate discomfort and hopefully just kind of keep everything together while you're calling your vet and getting your farrier. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then this is, this is that laminar wedge. So this is a horse here that had some um, acute, laminitis and the the laminar wedge is that fibrous looking area there at the toe and we trimmed to remove some of the material there because it creates leverage can you use your pointer and just point out to us where that is can you see my pointer yep right here oh good okay yeah so right here this is the laminar wedge and this horse actually has this is not blood it looks like blood but it's actually serum so this is a, a part of the necrotic tissue that comes out um, as you rehabilitate the horse. This is normal. Um, it is blood tinged because it's almost like they get like a blood blister or a hematoma in their foot. And that has to either be reabsorbed or come out somewhere. Right. So right. When, when we trim this down, sometimes we get some of that. This is a fairly stable laminar wedge. Uh, okay, define laminar wedge again for me. Yeah, so laminar wedge is, oh, I can't show you on that. Yep, I'll share. Let me see. Oh, yeah, this that's a term I'm not familiar with. Laminar wedge, really? Yeah. Yeah. So that's all stretched fibrous laminine. So when the bone rotates, it this is the scar tissue that fills in. Oh, okay. So it's basically what's trying to reconnect the wall to the to the lamina. Yes. And it, but it's scarred. Okay, that makes sense now. Now yes. I got it. Yes. Yeah. And that's why it's so fibrous like that. If you remember, the lamini are like, they look like pleats on a lampshade. Yeah. So these are the pleats that have been damaged, and it's the, the bone and the body trying to reconnect and stabilize the foot. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, we do have a question. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, Let's see, is the bone able to, mi no, sorry, we did that one. For the elderly horse with chronic laminitis, can they stay in a boot for the remainder of their life to keep them comfortable? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, to me, to some degree, um, for most horses, any horse that needs to live in a boot should really be in a shoe. Um, just because living in boots has some problems, their feet do distort a little differently. But if it's a logistical concern, a budget concern, or a management concern, absolutely they can live in boots. We have, we have horses that do that. It's important to keep the boots really clean. You're probably gonna need at least two pairs. That way if one gets a little damp or um, just needs to air out for a while, you can switch boots. Um, so you have a second pair. Um, and we liberally gold bond boots every day when the horses are wearing them. So you would it'd be maintenance. Right, so you've got to make sure you keep things dry and clean. Yes, exactly. So here's that laminar oh, wedge. Oh, can you go back to, you didn't, you oh. go back one. Yeah, so we were just talking about the difference. I mean, this, this presentation is geared towards um, hoof care professionals. So there's probably right. some information in here that's a lot, but this is just the idea that the horse on the left um, that foot, the white foot has an unstable laminar wedge, meaning the foot has not 
reattached well yet. And so when you're cutting into this, it's really like wet tissue paper and it's not strong. Okay. Where on the other side, the dark foot is a stable laminar wedge where you treat it like normal foot. So you can trim it, you can load it, you can paint things on it, whatever you want to do. It acts like normal foot. And honestly, for most of our horses we work on, these grow out. So as you see the, the foot grow down with healthier attachment, the laminar wedge grows out, and then usually you have a fairly tight white line when you're done again. So basically you're looking at the body trying to form some kind of scar tissue that's going to hold things together as it can grow new foot and then recover. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So this is a picture of that, okay? So this is, you know, P3 is marked the triangle and the rotation would have been the foot to the left of the image is where the old foot was. And when these horses start growing again, they grow in the new foot from the coronary band parallel to where the bone is now. Okay. So the new growth follows the bone. So you can see the angle of the old growth and then the rotation occurred. And the, the yellow gold triangle there is the laminar wedge. That's the material that's filled in the void where, where the rotation happened. Okay. So when we want to correct these horses, what we do is what's called a derotation trim, where we uh, take heel material off at the back of the heels, we preserve all the sole, which is why that dotted pink line on the ground surface is at a completely different angle. And then we reduce that laminar wedge and roll the toe. Awesome. And, cool, cool image, really helps. Good, okay, good. So this is the idea. So this is a radiograph over, over a photograph and I've drawn out the hoof capsule and the coffin bone and the bones inside the joints and actually where the shadow of the corium is because you can actually see that in a radiograph. You can see the blood supply. Wow. And that helps keep the hoof care provider safe when we're trimming these things because everything is in different places and you don't know without a radiograph. Right. So radiographs are critical. But you want to get the leverage off this toe. That laminar wedge there, if you have leverage on something that's not well attached, it's going to keep tearing at it like a hangnail. Ouch. Or, right. or if you were just to like take your fingernail and keep pulling it away from the underlying nail bed, it would be stress on there all the time. Exactly. So. Some people feel that you leave laminar wedges. Personally, I take them down because I think the more leverage I can get off of that, that lamini, the better. And I haven't seen a negative um, impact from that, so I keep doing it. And of course, you, as a professional, you, you have already conferred with your team and you know what you're looking at. So the reason I'm saying that is that anybody who, like me, is trimming their own horse if we had that situation, we absolutely would stop tripping our own horse and get professional help. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, you have to be prepared with tools. Let's say I take a laminar wedge down and the horse is less comfortable. Well, I have tools to support that horse and to make sure they stay comfortable. Right. Whether that's a boot or a glue on shoe or a hoof cast, you know, I can put material back. So you're right, Wendy. It's easy for me to say, oh yeah, I take these things down, but with a lot of experience and knowledge, right? Right, right. And that's, it's always, um, uh, you know, that's, oops, what did I do? Uh, switch to sharing content. There we go. Oh, I hit a button I've never hit before. <laughs> ooh, ooh, that's exciting. Yeah, I was trying to get back to having both of us on the little uh, thumbnails, but somehow I, I can't seem to do that, but that's okay. Okay. Keep going. This is awesome. Okay. So why don't we talk a little bit about the stages of laminitis? Okay. okay. Because we use the word founder, we use the word laminitis interchangeably, and sometimes that can be very difficult and confusing. So personally, I like to get rid of the word founder because as a layman's term, some people use it one way, some people use it another way, and it can be not clear in our communications. So for me, we have um, three main stages of laminitis plus two sub subcategories. Um, the first is developmental, and that actually happens before you see the pain. So sometimes we can also see that in horses that have what we call subclinical laminitis, or you're not seeing the outside symptoms, but the foot is being affected by this really low-grade inflammation. 
So that's, that is, that is tough. It's like their feet are slow cooking all the time, but your health care provider or your veterinarian should be able to help you determine if you have any of that going on. Um, developmental is hard. You might know you have developmental laminitis or suspect that you do if your horse is incredibly obese and they all of a sudden become a little foot tender. But if the foot tenderness has come, you're already rolled over into acute. So to me, any horse that's obese, and we'll talk about what that means in just a little bit, um, it should be considered to be at risk of laminitis. Uh, statistically, 50% of obese horses get laminitis. Wow. And uh, one of the things people don't realize, and this goes back to Dr. Clayton's work, is that the first thing you lose in lameness is suspension. So mm -hmm. it's very possible that these horses, or is it possible that these developmental laminitic horses, they're actually starting to lose suspension. You see a flatness in their gait because they're not comfortable. Well, the pain comes in the acute phase. Oh, okay. So, so they could still be moving like a yeah. normal horse. Yeah, it means that things in their body are changing. Um, Dr. Pollitt, who is a fabulous researcher from University of Queensland, um, who's one of the experts on laminitis, he says that um, every laminitic event is a, a toxicity reaction no matter where it's coming from, it's the, what causes the actual laminitis. So developmental would be something in their system is going toxic and it just hasn't shown up in their feet yet. Okay. Okay. So acute laminitis then is once you see that flatness, that lack of suspension, it might not be an acute onset like you come out to the barn one day and all of a sudden the horse can't walk. It might be that your horse that's normally really forward is just being quote unquote lazy today, right? Right. It's a little more reluctant to move or a little less suspension in the gait, like Dr. Clayton says. Right. Um, chronic laminitis then is once you have laminar change, once you have rotation or sinking, now you have chronic laminitis. But a chronically laminated course can be acute as well. So you can have one that has rotation or sinking, but is also acutely painful and having continued active inflammation. And you can have a chronic horse with rotation or sinking who's stable, who has no active inflammation, no toxic effect going on, and their feet are just showing the long-term effect of having had laminitis, but they're stable. So if you have a horse that, say, has laminitis last year and then has laminitis again this year, is that then both acute cases as right. long as there's been no rotation? Well, right. Although chances are, if you're having recurrent bouts of laminitis like that, chances are you're now chronic. Okay. It's, it would be very unusual for a horse to have multiple inflammatory events without having some kind of rotation or sinking. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Because if, if it happens once out of the blue, you know, did they eat something that upset their digestive system? Did they... Um, get a fever, they had a sickness and had a fever and they got a little bit of inflammation in their feet. That's one thing. When you have it happen year after year or even worse seasonally, like every spring or every fall, those horses are usually metabolic and um, they often have subclinical changes happening in between those events. Okay, they may, you may not have seen it because you didn't take an x-ray, but it's most likely there. Right, right, yeah. Exactly. Um, so, you know, we have all these different kinds of laminitis, you know, endocrinopathic is your metabolic horses, the ones that have insulin resistance or Cushing syndrome. Um, PPID. PPID horses, right? That's your endocrinopathic because yeah. it's your endocrine system that's being impacted in the horse. Uh, toxemia is like the gut, you know, uh, getting inflamed and um, having, say, a, a bacteria overload or a, you know, um, a die off of bacteria with a poor pH, things like that. Compensatory limb is like Barbaro, where he broke his one leg and then foundered in the other. Um, acute illness like Potomac horse fever, we get out here, right, Wendy? Yeah. Um, or even like some acute cases of Lyme disease we'll see, we'll get laminitis as a complication. And then, of course, the typical grain overload of, you know, my horse broke into the grain bin and ate 30 pounds of sweet feed. You know, those are less common now. Um, but 
but all of these, uh, Dr. Pollitt says, are actually toxemia. So what's that road what actually, founder? Because you'll hear somebody say, well, oh, my horse road foundered. Right. So road founder is about repeat uh, concussion. Um, so like our Amish driving horses here will often get road founder because their feet are hitting the pavement repeatedly day after day over time. And um, they just get inflamed with the metal shoes with the boreum. Their feet get inflamed and they end up with, um, uh, you know, damaged feet. So would that be in compensatory limb category? It's sort of, yeah, I guess it should be added to my list. Okay. Because that's when, you know, my horse road foundered and you're like, okay, well. <laughs> I think the bottom line is that all the, these driving horses on the road here, they don't all get road founder. So the bottom line comes down to, the reason I don't have it on the list is because if a horse gets road founder, it's because they have something else going on. Okay, so it's not a primary, it's a secondary to that's, to that's my, primary that's missed. Yeah. yeah, because otherwise, why wouldn't all the horses that do 10 miles a day on the road over the past four years all get road founder? And they yeah, don't. Good question. So to me, that goes back to toxemia. Like something in their system is off. They're, they've got an underlying virus that, that, you know, they don't have a fever. You know, they're not showing external signs. Something else is going on to create a situation where they're not tolerating their work on the road. Okay. I mean, look at hunter jumper horses, right? Like, yeah. But what we see it's, in those feet. That's the thing is you see horses that some of them are great and others. Yeah. Aren't. Yeah. So that makes sense. That if there's some underlying inflammation that then you add a secondary insult and it, and it comes out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And with most of these horses, whether it's endocrinopathic or otherwise, whether it's your PPID horse or, or something else, it's usually takes one thing to tip the horse over the edge. Right. Right. So like, that's why we have such trouble with something like vaccines. Well, the vaccines don't cause the laminitis, but it might be the last thing that challenged the horse's system that tips them over the edge into active laminitis. But the vaccine itself isn't doing it. So or you've got to be really careful then with the laminitic horse not to add a, another insult during that whole process. Well, right. Yeah, you're not, I would, I would tell you, um, it'd be inadvisable to worm that horse. It'd be inadvisable to vaccinate that horse at that time. And it says right on the, the label for the vaccines, it says, you know, uh, for healthy horses, you know, do not vaccinate a sick horse. Yeah. So, so we're back to our team and making sure we consult with our vet and everybody to make sure that during that whole process, we're not adding insult to injury. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, one of the biggest resources we look at, especially for these obese types, is um, the equine Cushing's and is insulin resistant group, which is Dr. Kellen's group. Um, you know, there's some fabulous resources there about um, how to manage the metabolic horse, the PPID horse. Um, we refer a lot of people to um, that site in particular, just because it's a huge uh, group of information that is readily available in a crisis. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna ask Monique. Monique, can you please put your question in the chat? It's just a lot easier to manage that way she raised her hand and yeah, we want to what she wants to ask but it's just easier if they if they put it in the chat okay and in the meantime so in the meantime um one of the things that i always look at with from the farrier perspective is managing my laminated courses once you've booted them and you've gotten the underlying cause of the laminitis um, identified with your veterinarian and the horse is less acute do you put a shoe on them or not and for me, I use glue-on composite shoes. So I put a lot of these types of horses in glue-on composites when they've been in boots for over three months. I wanna kind of get them out of the boots and get them moving more normally, especially if our expectation is for them to go back to work. So I did a retrospective study into my database. So I have this database of over um, 500,000 hoof pictures with corresponding radiographs. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's fabulous. I don't, I don't know anybody else who has a database like that with radiographs and photographs of horses taken at the same time with a repeatable technique and then over time 
for the horse. So I have horses I've been documenting for 15 years. Are you publishing this? Well, that's the plan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the plan. Um, so I did this retrospective study um, into my database and I looked at how many horses did I have um, baseline blood work showing that they were PPID metabolic horses, radiograph showing their um, laminitis was chronic. Um, and then I had photographs and radiographs of these horses over time. And I was able to find 110 horses that I actually had very, very solid data on. And then I had data when I considered them rehabilitated, I had data showing that their blood work normalized, their radiographs were back to um, you know, no rotation, no sinking, you know, tight white line, and um, that they were back to their pre-laminitic level of soundness. So if they were a dressage horse, they went back to dressage. If they were a hunter jumper horse, they went back to jumping, so on and so forth. So 110 horses, which was a pretty large pool. That's a huge number, actually. Yeah, to have all that solid data on. Right. That's, that's well done. Very well done. <laughs> so then I looked at them and I said, of those 110, how many did I put into shoes? Because most of my horses are barefoot. So I was like, well, when do, how much am I really utilizing glue-on composite shoes? So, Wendy, do you care to guess how many horses actually went into shoes of those 110? I, you know, it's one of those questions that you could, you, I could guess high or I could guess low. And um, I have a feeling it's low. Okay. So just, just give a number. Just like uh, 25. 25. Okay. So you're very close. I actually put 33 of those horses into shoes. Wow. And some of these horses were rehabilitated here at our, our farm, at our rehabilitation center. And some of the horses were treated at their um, home farm. But out of all the 33 that went into shoes, how many do you think came out of shoes by the end when we considered that they were rehabilitated? Oh, how many came out or how many were still in shoes? Either way you want to think about it. How many? Um, I'm going to say five were still in shoes. Ah, okay. So there you're off. Okay. <laughs> Three came out of shoes. Oh, wow. 30 stayed in shoes. So that tells me two things. One, it tells me that um, once these horses become sound and they can go back to work, the owners typically don't want to change anything. So it's not how many could have come out of shoes, it's how many did come out of shoes. Well, we don't know how many could have come out of shoes, right? Exactly, that, that's right? What, you're, what I'm hearing you say is that when yeah. you have a, ask the owners, they don't wanna change anything, so they're willing to keep the status quo, therefore they didn't come out of shoes, but we don't know, they may have been able to. Right, yeah. and the other part of it that stood out to me is that the horses that went into shoes were the horses that had the most damage. Well, that makes sense. I can understand that. So the other ones that were, were rehabbed in boots and for, um, was it Barb, you asked about uh, how, can an elderly horse stay in boots? Was that Barb? Yes. So, you know, yeah, you can manage these horses in boots long term and then they can either transition to barefoot or they can stay in boots as needed. Um, but for certain horses, especially if they're going to go back to work, and I think that was another component of it was a lot of the horses that stayed in their glue on shoes were horses that were actually back riding, trail riding, competing in dressage, jumping, doing things. And so keeping them in some protective footwear meant that they could use the horse, um, you know, maybe abuse the feet a little bit more and they felt safe doing that. Right. But the, the peace of mind factor is yeah. not to be outweighed in terms of you know, what you're going to ask your horse to do and whether or not you feel comfortable with him being able to do that without any additional protection. Exactly. Exactly. So I actually was able to um, present this at the uh, West Palm Beach uh, laminitis conference that uh, Penn used to put on down, down in Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, then the horse actually wrote it up. So you can actually search for this, this article on the horse. Why is your name not listed as author? because it was written by Alexandra Beckstedt. Okay. Yeah, she wrote the article about my presentation. Oh, got it, okay. Yeah. That's, that's fabulous, and to have that kind of data, as a research scientist, which I, which I was in my you know, 
past life, it feels like, mm -hmm. um, you know, to have that kind of data that's that solid is really impressive. And, you know, my hat's off to you to be able to not only have the data, but collect the data, which is in itself, <laughs> you know. Very labor intensive. Yes, yes very. A so lot that, of time taking pictures and sitting in front of my computer processing data. Yeah, it's awesome. Thanks. So, um, you know, certainly there's a lot of approaches to diet for most of these horses. I mean, I think most, most owners and hoof care providers, we deal with the, you know, obesity related, PPID related laminitis, right? Especially when we talk about grass and spring where, you know, your horse has been sitting around all winter and you give them extra hay and you're not riding as much and oops, Fluffy got a little bit too heavy in their body condition. And then the spring grass comes in and before you know it, they're laminitic. Right. And it's a classic story. I mean, it happens to so many of us. Yes. And, and so often what I see is that, you know, the horses are a little heavy and then the owner has a life event that draws them away where they're not able to, to be looking at their horses and they come back a week later and it's done. Yes. You know, um, and I just want to tell everybody that Dr. Herman last week in her talk, we talked about um, I, the difference between IR and PPID. And so, and there's some great information there. So anybody that's really um, interested in learning more and, and listening about diet, just go watch Dr. Herman's webinar on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Yeah, absolutely. She has lots of great information to help these horses. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, for me, I tend to go to, um, you know, looking at the hay acutely yep. for these horses, at least slowing them down on eating their hay. Most hay is safe, um, but, you know, you should weigh the hay and feed it in a slow feed hay net. And I have the rate here that we like to recommend. So you use a weight tape on your horse once a week if you yep. want to lose weight um, and do it objectively. You know, make sure that you're putting the weight tape. The same person is weight taping the horse and you're weight taping in the girth groove and up over the wither, perpendicular to the ground, the same way every time. And what we're looking for is really not how much the horse actually weighs, what we're looking for is a, a change in weight over time. So as long as your technique is consistent and you're using the same weight tape and the same person's taking it in the same location on the horse, we're looking to see, you know, your horse should lose 10 pounds a week is the goal. So, you know, that means not too fast and not too slow. And if you weight tape your horse, you can do either, you can weigh your hay, you can feed it at a rate of one and a half percent of their current body weight or 2% of their ideal weight, whichever is greater. And the goal is to have hay in front of your horse 24 seven. So they don't go even an hour without something to nibble on. So your hay net, your slow feed hay net has to slow them down enough that they can pick at it all day long eating basically so that you don't have to give them extra. Right. Um, and then, you know, we, we tend to look at omega fatty acids. Those are helpful because it helps with insulin sensitivity. Um, and we know that it's the insulin that causes the laminitis in our metabolic horses. Um, there's really good studies where they gave um, uh, very uh, fast metabolic horses, thoroughbreds, young thoroughbreds, they gave them um, uh, high levels of insulin and it caused them to have laminitis directly. So oh, wow. Yeah, Dr. Harmon talked a lot about insulin and IR and that sort of thing. So this is nice to see the tie-in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the name of the game with the, the obese horses, the metabolic horses, is keeping their insulin level low and steady. No, no spikes in that insulin. Yep. You need to look at the supplements you give. You need to look at um, your... Um, your treats, you know, keeping things what we call low glycemic, so it doesn't spike that insulin for them over time. Um, and there's lists of things that I can provide, safe treats and things if, if you all want that at some point, you know, um, just because, you know, we deal with the horses here on, at the rehab facility. So this is how we manage our horses here. Um, most of the horses I get in here are the metabolic types that need to lose weight and also need um, intervention with their feet. So uh, we're, you know, we walk the walk and talk the talk. So we can help you with practical application if you need some input. Um, somebody's asking, they'd love to see a list of treats. Maybe that's something that we can um, put up uh, on Facebook when I put up the video. The yeah. The list. Yeah, absolutely. Leptin. I, I keep hearing the word leptin. What, what is leptin and why do I keep hearing that word lately? <laughs> uh, well, so, okay. So 
there are ways that we can test if a horse is metabolic. This is the things that your veterinarian might do. Although if I tell you that your horse has a 50% chance of colicking, if you do X, Y, and Z, you probably would not do that, correct? So we really can almost pick these horses out based on their phenotype, which means their body condition. So if your horse is obese, to me, that is an emergency intervention to prevent laminitis, which means you need to get your horse on these protocols and get tested ASAP. Okay. The tests that you're going to do um, are going to be um, simply would be an ins a baseline insulin with a glucose, uh, maybe a full thyroid panel and an ACTH. That's sort of your baseline metabolic panel. Mm -hmm. But leptin is also a measure of um, a hormone that's put out in relation to insulin. And so that test is more sensitive than the insulin test. So if you test leptin levels, that can also give you an abnormal range, which will tell you if the horse is having um, metabolic disease. So leptin's a hormone? I think so. I'm not the veterinarian, Wendy. So Okay. You know, that I would refer I'm just, to choice. I, like I said, that suddenly that word seems to be coming up to me and I'm like, hmm, I'll have yeah. to go update some more. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I don't want to misspeak. Okay. No worries. I'll go, I'll go Google it and dig around and see what I can find. Yeah. Um, and then there's also the, um, with the ACTH, that's a measure of another hormone that's produced by the pituitary gland that would be abnormal, abnormally elevated. Um, in response to this, the metabolic circle, basically, the layman's way that I understand it is the insulin spikes and it affects the thyroid hormone and it affects the pituitary gland, your adrenals are affected, um, cortisol is affected, all of these, this, this endocrinopathic cycle is impacted. Right. That's our PPID. Well, that would be your Cushing source, right? Yeah, PARS pituitary intermedia dysfunction. Right. Uh, and, and again, Joyce talks about that and g does a nice explanation too. Yeah. So we can refer that to her, you know, to her oh, that's right. webinar. Thanks, Barb. Um, yeah. Leptin drives hunger. That's right. Joyce talking about that too. So yeah. Well, it's part, of, I know it's part of that hormonal pathway. Yeah. You know, in terms of um, that insulin uh, being elevated, like horses that are voraciously hungry all the time often have insulin, have high insulin. That's probably why the leptin can be tested that way. Got it. Thanks, Barb. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so the TRH stimulation test is a test that's more sensitive for PPID. Okay. And so that's a, another good one that we've been using lately. Um, if the ACTH looks normal, then, but you really suspect that the horse is PPID, then you can ask your vet for a TRH stimulation test. Okay. So um, sometimes we're doing iron, iron testing on these horses. Um, they, they can be iron overloaded. And there's a uh, Kansas State University has a specific iron panel. We're not just looking at a blood serum iron level, but there's def definitely different markers um, we look at for that. Um, there's also an oral sugar test, which I would not do on a horse that I think is in trouble. You give a 60 cc syringe of caro syrup to a horse and test their insulin to see if they have an insulin spike in response. That sounds like what they do with people. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, it, is, it is a gold standard test, um, meaning if you get an insulin spike that's abnormal, then you have a metabolic horse. The problem is if your horse is already producing too much insulin to um, regulate these things and we give them something that causes an insulin spike, I think potentially you could exacerbate the horse's condition with good intentions. Right. So that's a test I personally stay away from. A lot of veterinarians uh, will use it. Um, I think we can use insulin and leptin and honestly phenotype. If it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck yeah. and it quacks like a duck, it's probably like all of us. We can all deal with less sugar and more exercise in our lives. Yeah, no, so how, very true. <laughs> right? So, so how is that harmful to the horse? So if your horse fits the phenotype, the blood work is helpful because it gives you a baseline. But if I had an animal who was obese, I would treat it anyway, just because it's healthier for the animal. In terms right. of management, right? Like limit the thing grass, is, um, diet. All these other things are just conferring. You know, I, I love in Chinese medicine, it's like, look at the patient, talk to the patient. Don't just look at the blood work. And if you look and they're exactly. obese, then you need to start doing something while you're getting your blood work. But don't wait for the blood work to come back. Get going. 
yeah, like if you see a middle-aged man walking down the road and they have muscle wasting and a pot belly, you know, what do you think of immediately? Diabetes and heart disease. Yep. Because we've been taught that that body condition goes with those problems. And this is the same for the horse. Right. So this is what we're talking about body condition, right? So we're looking at the fat pads on the horse and the Heineke body condition scale is this picture on the right. I'm getting my pointer here. I hate it when I lose my mouse. It, um, you got to click on your PowerPoint and it'll come back. Oh. Nope. No? It's not. I don't see it. But um, at any rate, so in the picture on the horse, you can see the locations of the fat pads that we're looking for are along the neck. That's what we consider a crusty neck, which this poor little halflinger on the left is exhibiting quite well. He's got quite the crest there with his hair sticking up. Um, along the withers, that creates almost what we call like a mutton wither look to the horse where they get those fat pads and then it looks like their withers have no prominence, but really it's just fat. I mean, there are mutton withered horses, right? But right. this is like fat pads make them look rounder than they are. A lot of horses get a fat pad right behind their shoulder blade on their ribs. That's a big one that you can usually find on horses. And then, you know, behind the elbow area, they say behind the shoulders there, um, you know, that's an area where we get a fat pad. They get a, a channel down their back. They'll get like a groove down their back. And that's because they have fat along both sides yeah. and their um, both sides of their back. And they get like a groove where their spine is in the middle. So if they have a channel down their back, that's a bad sign. And then they get what we call an apple butt where they get this big pad of fat right at their tail head. And then they also get the super orbital socket fat pad, which is right above their eyes. There should be that divot there and it gets filled with fat and it will actually bulge out. Oh, wow. And you know, it's so hard. So many people are used to looking at fat horses that it's, that it's like anything. As you get uh, conditioned to that look, you don't recognize it as being unhealthy. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I used to think that Wendy was muscled. You remember Wendy? Oh, Wendy? yeah. Wendy. Wendy. Um, I just thought he was well muscled. He was in dressage work six days a week, you know, and right. then until he had laminitis and somebody's like, well, you know, your horse is fairly obese. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's not obese. He's in tons of work, but he had, he had metabolic disease. So, you know, yep. I didn't realize how abnormal that was. And that was before you met him. Otherwise yep. you would have told me, you would have said, Daisy, Wendy is fat because owners love to hear that. Right. Yeah, I know. You know that. So the, yes, it's hard to tell them because they don't want to hear it and they because they have to do something about it and they don't always have the control over the environment to do something. So it becomes this, you know, this blob of, I don't know what to do, but we really do have to take control of that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the tough love thing, right? right? Like, you know, you are in control of every bit of something that goes in this horse's mouth at the end of the day, right. you know, so it needs to be managed for them for their health and well-being. But it's, it's hard because, you know, they, we often, I mean, myself included, if, if one of my horses gets overweight, I, I feel incredibly guilty about that. Like I've hurt them with kindness, you know. Yes, but intentions. a lot of people feel they're hurting their horse by de denying him. And this is, I've had this discussion with people yeah. about muzzles and that they think the muzzle is cruel, yes. but laminitis is much more cruel and much more you know, life-threatening than wearing a muzzle. And that's one of the reasons I'm actually running a special with Harmony Muzzles and Sherfoot Pads this month because, you know, if the muzzle is actually your friend to prevent your horse from winding up in this discussion. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. So that Heineke body condition scale is, is described pretty clearly here. Um, and what we're talking about is, you know, ideal would be considered five, the moderate, Anything above that, and I personally like my horses to be about a four, four and a half, mm -hmm. um, especially if your horse has any arthritis or any existing body issues otherwise, um, keeping your horse a little bit on the lean side can be super helpful because less weight on their feet, less weight on their joints, right? Yep. Just like um, people. I, forget, I think it's for every pound of weight, we're overweight, it's like 40 pounds of pressure on our knees. Something crazy. Yeah. 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 Really wild. And so think about the horse and then, you know, as the rider and attack and everything gets put on them, it's even, it's even compounded even more. Yep. So, you know, keeping, keeping aware of the Heineke body condition scale is a good one. 
um, that horse in this previous slide here, he would have considered be considered about an eight. Okay. On that scale, which you know means fat. He's just yeah. fat. He's not extremely fat. He's just fat. He's close to extremely fat. <laughs> yes. Yes, but it is possible to get weight off these horses. Yeah. So the top horse is a different halflinger mare, and she was about that eight or nine body condition scale. And then we got some weight off of her and she came down to about a six. And then in that last picture on the right, upper right corner, she's about um, a five right there. And that's the same horse. And people say, well, my horse is just built big. Mm -hmm. Not if they have fat pads like on the Heineke scale. And then the horse on the bottom row um, is an Arabian that was, was quite round. She probably would have been about a seven there. And then um, we got the weight off of her and we rehabbed her here at the farm and she got really lean. Look how lean she got in that after yeah. picture. You can see April ribs, time. yay! <laughs> no, and the muscle definition in her neck and everything. Yeah. And she became sound and went back to work and um, you know, she put on more muscle because a lot of times I think we mistake you know, fat as muscle. Yes, I've seen trainers do that. They- yeah, Well, I did it too. You know, yeah. but. It, I mean, as professionals, they put fat on horses and call it muscle, and everybody thinks their horse is muscled, but it's not. Right, exactly. So this mare, when she left, this is probably about a three and a half on the body condition scale. She was really lean, mm -hmm. but the owner had asked us to get rid of as much of the fat deposits on her as possible. And what happens when they lose the last of this fat is they look awful because there's toxins stored in the fat. And so you think, oh my gosh, my horse is in really poor condition. But what's actually happening is they're getting rid of the last of the fat and all those toxins are just dumping into their system and they have to deal with them and get rid of them. And then they look beautiful like this and they can build the muscle back. Yeah. And then we can actually see what's real. You know, what's real muscle as opposed to... Yeah, exactly. Okay. Just, so, um... you know, something we think is muscle and stuff. Is there a question? No, um, somebody here raised their hand, but I'm asking them to put their question. Molly, if you could put your question in the chat, it's just a, a whole lot easier to handle just with the technology. <laughs> okay, just go yes. ahead, Lazy, and if when that question, um, oh yeah, when that question shows up, I'll ask you. Okay, this this slide, this link actually I think doesn't exist anymore. GI ratio is a way to look at blood work that appears normal and we compare the glucose to insulin ratio. It's a, it's a measure that's taken from the human world and some veterinarians don't like it because the predictive ratios are based on human data and how does that relate to horses. But I can tell you when we do the GI ratio, like you'll have a glucose taken independently that's normal and an insulin taken independently that's normal and you compare this ratio and it should be um, greater than four. And if it's four or less, your horse is in big trouble. And um, this GI ratio calculation is actually now on the ECIR horse site. It's moved over there. This was developed by a um, university. And every time we've, we've seen a horse that phenotype looks like it's in trouble, has not had acute laminitis yet, I'm saying, I really think you need to treat your horse like it's metabolic. Let's get some blood work done. Let's talk to your vet. And the blood work comes back normal. The owner sometimes isn't motivated to make any changes. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at GI ratio, the GI ratio will show us that there's an abnormal relationship between the glucose and the insulin, um, which is also indicative of metabolic disease. So Every time that I've ignored that, when I looked at the GI ratio and I said, well, the GI ratio says, I'm, I'm thinking this horse is in trouble, you know, maybe pro proactively we'll just treat the horse through management, you know, diet, exercise, keeping it off the grass or using a muzzle. Um, if we don't do that and the owner just kind of goes on like normal, the horse inevitably gets laminitis. Yeah. Somebody's asked, um, you know, you're thinning down these fat horses. Do you need to take them down to a three or a, is a five, you know, basically you took that Arab down to, what did you say, a four? Or a th three, three and a half. Three and a half. Case. So do you need to take them down that far or was that just a, that particular owner wanted that horse to be a little under? 
That's a good question. I would never recommend dropping a horse to a certain weight or a certain body condition. It's individual to the animal. So in that horse's case, in order to get rid of the last of her unhealthy fat pads, she needed to get that lean. And we didn't say, oh, we're just gonna starve her because that's not what we're doing. We're giving the horses plenty of food. They're getting hay in front of them 24 seven and anything they're getting that's a concentrate is low glycemic so it doesn't spike their insulin. So it's also really nice with these horses when you feed them like this is you can feed them more and they will lose weight or maintain weight. So in this horse's case, we just kept her on a pretty strict diet um, with safe, safe, safe feeds in front of her, no grass until she had lost the last of her fat pads. Some horses will do that at a body condition score of a five and some will do that like this mare at a three and a half. Also keep in mind that we were under um, veterinary supervision while doing this. So the vet was on board with how lean this horse had become. So you're actually really looking at the location and type of fat that you're, that the unhealthy fat, if you will. Yeah. And in that horse's case, you really wanted to get rid of all of the unhealthy fat before you started layering on healthy fat. Yeah, or just healthy muscle is the goal. So, right. you know, you get them back to work, you can feed them more, right. um, you can give them things that might be a little bit higher in sugar. And I'm not saying give them high glycemic feed, but things that are, you know, maybe you introduce a little bit of grass seasonally because now they're in work and they're burning more calories and they're building muscle and you need to support that process. Yeah, it's like my horse, Al, he's a Clyde thoroughbred cross. When he's out of work, he's very Clyde and he can put on weight easily. But when he's in work, he burns it off and I have to feed him. So he's an interesting horse because he flips metabolically from fat to thin to, you know, no food to feed. Right, right. But you have to adapt based on the season and the climate and his level of work and all those things. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. So, you know... Again, you know, this, this slide is designed for the hoof care providers that come to some of our classes, but I think as, as owners or anyone involved in the hoof care industry, these questions are, are important to think about. You know, do you need to spend the money on your blood work? Well, you can, you can if you're an objective person and you like to have numbers to back up what you see in front of you, absolutely. Um, I'm always someone who likes to have objective information to back up what I'm subjectively observing. So I like blood work just as a baseline. I like blood work periodically. Um, if you make a change, do blood work in two to four weeks um, just to make sure that things are coming down and think that the interventions you're doing are on the right track. Um, <clears throat> sometimes certain blood work can be tricky in the fall because of the seasonal influence of, of change on hormones, but now we have normal ranges for those things. So um, that should be doable even in the fall. Um, sometimes if the horse is in pain, uh, we don't want to do blood work because it could be elevated because they're stressed. But personally, I think we just need a baseline of this is what's going on right now. Um, and really at the end of the day, the biggest reason is because you can never go back and see where you were. Right. So to have that picture and the same with the radiographs, you know, get baseline radiographs of the horse's feet when all this is occurring so that you know if there's been change going on into the future. I get blood yeah. work done regularly, so that I have a baseline and, yeah. you know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's important to check in on things even when you feel okay. I mean, but that's I recommend the that. best time to get a good baseline is when you're feeling right. okay. It's when you're feeling okay. Yeah, what's normal for you? Um, in fact, I would recommend, you know, you get your spring or fall visit from your veterinarian, do a health check, you know, any of those things. Um, get a set of baseline hoof radiographs. You know, it, it's, it's a once a year investment and you can just get a couple of farrier views, lateral and dorsal palmar views of the feet. And you'll, you'll be glad you have them if anything happens. And you might actually catch problems before they occur. Mm -hmm. So I like preventative stuff. I like data. So um, we talked about some of that. We talked about the, the deep digital flexor tendon. Yep. This is again, some farrier stuff like when the tendon might need to be cut. I don't know yeah. if you want to go into that, Wendy. No, nope, that's okay. <laughs> okay, oh. let's get out of that then. We'll skip that. Um, I mean, this is some cool stuff down here. Do you want to talk about some of this stuff? This is cool stuff. Yeah, let me look at our time. 
Yeah, how are we doing on time? What time? Uh, what's two? We're, we're about fifteen minutes over. So, um, oh gosh, time flies when you're having. Fun. I know it's just really amazing. So I think you know what might be really good, Daisy, is if we kind of wrap up this portion of your of your um, talk, and because we can always come back again, I'm always happy to have you back as a guest. Um, yeah. And that sounds great. I think this is probably enough information for people to chew on, but if you have a, you know, like a slide or two at the end that just kind of sums it up. You know, I don't know if I do. You no, know, you don't want to, how about let's seeing a healthy foot? Can we see a healthy foot? Uh, a healthy foot in, on, on this, my presentation or in my hand? Either way. Model? I always want to okay. leave people with the idea of what, what is it that we're looking for, not what are we trying to avoid, if you know what I mean. Sure. Can you see me now? Yep. And I'm going to make you big, put a spotlight. Okay. Here. here we go. Okay. Okay. All right. So I would say out of all these feet I have here, that this one is very healthy on the inside. Actually has some flair here on the outside. We can, we can address oh, yeah. that in our trim work. Right. So that's a very healthy foot. And it's got um, a great big digital cushion there too. Right. Yeah. Right. Look at that. Yeah, really nice, big digital cushion. Yeah. Bob talked a lot about that. Yeah, Dr. Balker would be really happy with this digital cushion. Yep. The lateral cartilages. Um, let's see. Another healthy foot. That's the other side of that foot. Let's see. This is, this is a healthy foot. This is a fairly good one. The digital oh, yeah. cushion on this one, though, isn't as happy. Yeah, right. Not as much of a digital cushion. Right. right? But fairly good sole depth, tight white line. Everything's in alignment. Great. That one's not too bad. Yeah, and and they can go back. And they can so, go back. That's the bottom line. Is they can go back. Yep. Yeah, and that's one of the things that um, I really enjoyed listening to Dr. Balker about how malleable the foot really is. That it can get into distortion, but we can bring it back. And um, the horse's ability to heal get when you take away the insult is so amazing. The response and. Dr. Feldenkrais always talked about health as the ability to recover. It's not that we're going to not have an insult or we're not going to get sick or we're not going to get injured, but can we recover? And that's really the biggest sign of health. Yeah. And so, you know, I think here I'm hearing that same storyline from you that, it, that if, if this does happen, we have to do all the management to, to help the horse get healthy so that the horse can recover and get back to work. And the sooner and the more, the better yeah. our management is, and the sooner we can catch anything if it's going wrong, the faster we can get them back on that road to recovery. Yes, exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. Well, this has been another really fascinating webinar, and I'm so glad you're going to have to come back again. So we've got lots more to talk about. Uh, you know, it's it's so educational, and I enjoyed all your models. That was fabulous. That was great. Hey. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, Wendy. Thanks so much for having me here again. Oh, you're so welcome. And so any of you still watching, um, we have a special on the Surefoot Equine, sorry, on the uh, um, Murdoch Method shop is where you can purchase Surefoot pads, a Harmony muzzle and two pairs of pads. And uh, we're offering 30% off the Harmony muzzles because we want to help keep your horses safe and keep the grass minimized, especially right now. It's so lush and green here in Virginia that um, it's, a, it's just really out of control. And so one of the best ways to control it is to muzzle your horse if they out or are out on pasture. Um, and so for anybody that um, wants to see more, we have another great webinar tomorrow. My guest is Cheryl Gibson, and we're going to talk about laminitis. She does um, Equibo, the Bowen technique on horses. And we're going to talk about some of the things they've done with uh, laminitic horses and chronic laminitis to help them recover. So it's kind of like laminitis month. Um, it is the season. Um, thank you, Daisy, once again for joining me. I will be contacting you for yet another webinar. As always, this is a blast. And I get to see you more on webinars than I do in person these days. I know. I know. That's, that's, it's a blessing and a curse, right? It like, is. But, you know, you've got so much information to share and you present so well that, you know, people raved about the last one. And I'm just really glad to have you back. Thank so um, until tomorrow, I'll see everybody tomorrow. Thank you so much for tuning in and stay safe and be well. Bye-bye.